Now, let me introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Eleanor Gates. So Dr. Gates is a PhD at uh, the University of New Mexico. She's previously worked at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, uh, the IAE Minor Planet Center, uh, and uh, the Air Force Phillips Laboratory. Uh, she is currently one of the staff astronomers here at uh, Lick Observatory, as well as the visitor services supervisor. So uh, Dr. Gates is one of the main people responsible for organizing these summer events that we're all here to enjoy tonight. Um, so we're very fortunate to have her here with us uh, tonight, given how busy that uh, generally keeps her. Um, she's an expert in laser guide stars and uh, adaptive optics, and her research interests cover uh, active uh, galaxies and quasars. And tonight, she's going to be talking to us about new science and technology here at Lick Observatory. Take it away, Ellie. Okay. So thank you, John, for that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, I had a very difficult time actually figuring out what to talk about because there is so much exciting stuff going on here at Lick Observatory. Uh, so I've picked a few topics uh, to talk about, and I hope you'll be as excited hearing about them as I am uh, to share it with you. Uh, but first of all, we are sitting here on top of Mount Hamilton, the highest peak in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Lick Observatory has a large number of telescopes not all the telescopes are visu visible in this photograph. And of course, I won't have time to talk about all of them during my talk, but I'll pick a few to talk about. Um, and also, Lick Observatory was the first year-round accessible mountaintop observatory in the world when it was constructed in 1888 and uh, was set the trend for all large research observatories being on top of mountains. Uh, but I'm going to start the talk today with the cat's Whoops, automatic, oh golly. Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope. Uh, this is a small telescope, only 30 inches in diameter, but it was the first robotic telescope here on top of Mount Hamilton. So you can see it here with a group of graduate students that came up for a workshop on observational astronomy. But this telescope is dedicated to discovering supernova explosions in other galaxies. Now, who doesn't like huge explosions? You know, Fourth of July just went by and we saw, saw fireworks. So these are sort of the cosmic fireworks. When this telescope was installed in the 1990s here on Mount Hamilton, all the astronomers in the world, including all the amateur astronomers, were discovering maybe two dozen supernova explosions in a year. So that's a fair number, but this telescope, when it came online, started discovering on average two a week. So it was completely outstripping all the rest of the astronomers in the world um, with discovering supernovae. And this was great because um, supernovae are hard to catch. They're transient. And this telescope would find them by observing over a thousand galaxies a night. And then it would, on the subsequent nights, observe them again and again. And it would compare the images to previous images and see all of a sudden, is there one with a new star? in it. And if it saw a new star, it would flag it and say, oh, I need to observe this again. Because it might not have been a supernova explosion, because when you have a supernova explosion, it, it'll be brighter than any ob other object in the, the galaxy, a bright new star. Um, but there could be other things going on. It could be an asteroid that just happens to be going through that part of the sky when they took the photo. Um, or it could be what's called a cosmic ray, which is this particle hits the detector, looks like a star, but it's very, they're very random. Or it could be a particle from a radioactive decay. So it might look like a supernova, but not actually be one. So it would flag it to take an image either a few hours or the next day or the next time the weather was good. Um, and if that same new star was in the same place, it would flag it and say, aha, I think I found a supernova. Email the researchers uh, at Al excuse me, um, from Alex Filipenko's team at uh, UC Berkeley and say, I think I found something. Need a real human being to check and see if this is a real supernova or not. And this was great. So they were discovering lots of them. And there are two different types of supernovae, type 1As and type 2 supernovae. They're physically different processes. Um, so this image on the uh, 
left hand side is a type 1a supernova and on the left hand side we have a little animated gif showing sort of the, the supernova exploding getting brighter and then fading away um, now from just images like this you can't really tell which type of supernova is which but we have telescopes not just the kate telescope up here but other telescopes on mount hamilton that help us figure out what kind of supernova these things are and the first one I'm going to talk about are the type 1a supernovae. So these um, are sort of the special case supernova um, where you'll have a white dwarf star that has a companion that is turned into a red giant star and starts dumping material onto that white dwarf star. And then when that white dwarf star accumulates enough mass to be 1.4 times the mass of the sun, it explodes. <laughs> And super bright, you can see them way out, huge distances. And the nice thing about these supernovae is that because they always explode at the same mass, they're the same intrinsic brightness, making them what's called a standard candle, meaning we can actually measure the distance to that uh, galaxy pretty accurately. So it's sort of like a 100 watt light bulb. If it looks really bright, it's close. If it looks faint, it's far away. And we can actually measure that distance. What the astronomers did with this supernova, with this type of supernova, the ones they were discovering, was they compared that distance to how fast that galaxy was moving away from us due to the Big Bang. Um, and virtually all galaxies are moving away from us because the universe is expanding. And they wanted to figure out what's going to happen to the universe. Is there enough mass, enough galaxies, stars, gas, and dust in the universe that the expansion, the gravity, would slow it down and eventually the expansion would stop and maybe even start collapsing back in itself so that the universe would end in the big crunch? Not necessarily a pretty way to end the universe. Um, <laughs> or was there not enough matter so that the universe would keep expanding but slowly slow down and slow down? Um, it turned out the universe is weirder than we thought. Turned out that these, these galaxies that were further away from us were actually going faster than expected. That the universe is actually accelerating and expanding faster with time. And so when it was first discovered and announced, they had interesting names for this thing, such as quintessence, the fifth force, negative pressure. Eventually they settled on the term dark energy. And this discovery actually garnered the researchers, both at uh, UC Berkeley with Alex Filipenko's team, but also at Lawrence Berkeley Labs with Saul Perlmutter and Brian Schmidt. Anyway, they got the Nobel Prize for this discovery of dark energy back in 2011. Um, very exciting. And we don't really know yet what dark energy is. There are many exciting experiments to try and determine what dark energy is. Some people working on dark energy are speakers in our summer program. So, you know, if, if you haven't gotten a ticket to one of our last co concerts, you might hear a speaker talking about how they're trying to discover what dark energy is. And there's probably another Nobel Prize in there for whoever actually figures it out. So that's one type of supernova. The other type of supernova are what we call type 2 supernovae or core collapse supernovae. And these happen when stars way more massive than our sun end their lives in a huge explosion. Um, so what powers stars is nuclear fusion. That's where um, stars are mostly made out of hydrogen to begin with, with some helium. And the stars are so massive, um, it gets so hot and dense in the cores that those um, hydrogen atoms get smushed together, fused together to make helium. The helium atoms, if there's enough uh, heat and pressure, can get fused together to make uh, carbon and oxygen, and it proceeds up. Um, now, stars like our sun aren't terribly massive. Our sun is a middle-of-the-road star. Um, so, which is good for us, provides light, not too unstable, it's going to live a long time, all good. Um, but, you know, the, the nuclear fusion happens at the core, and eventually the core runs out of 
hydrogen. Um, so you might end up with helium fusion in the core and a shell of hydrogen fusion around it. And you know, the, our sun pretty much, when it starts making carbon, fusing carbon and stuff, it, it ends up with sort of a lot of carbon in its core. That's sort of as far as a, a s star like our sun will go. Um, when you get to stars that are more massive, um, there's enough heat and pressure from all the gravity of all the material in there to cause heavier elements to fuse, like uh, silicon and magnesium. And they'll keep fusing until they get up to iron, and you end up with this iron core. Um, all stars, um, when they sort of run out of helium, uh, sorry, hydrogen in their cores, sort of blow up into the red giant stars. So the bigger the star, you might get supergiant red giant stars. Um, a good example of that, a supergiant super giant red star would be Betelgeuse. And some of you might have heard recently in the news that Betelgeuse is getting brighter. We think that it's going to blow up in a supernova at the end of its lifetime sometime in the next 100,000 years. Pretty soon for a star lifetime. Could be tomorrow. That would be awesome. I would love to see a supernova that close and that bright. Um, but more likely it'll be tens of thousands or 100,000 years from now. Um, but uh, what happens is that when you get the core of the star, and you can sort of see in this diagram, you end up with, you know, you end up with this iron core that's not doing anything. It won't, iron won't fuse easily, um, so it sits there. And then you have shells of silicon fusion, magnesium fusion, etc. Um, when that iron core hits 1.4 times the mass of our sun, and this will only happen in stars that are maybe 8 to 10 times as massive as our sun and bigger, so this really is very, very big stars only, um, that core will collapse in on itself and become a neutron star. And when that implosion happens, because it can't support its own weight um, against gravity, because uh, there's no fusion happening in that iron, everything else sort of also implodes. And then there's this rebound explosion as it hits the neutron stars, are and out it goes. And here's a uh, nice animation of a core collapse supernova. It's, um, but what happens is that you have that uh, explosion, and then the material keeps going out. And it turns out that explosion has enough energy to fuse iron into heavier elements. Things like lead, zinc, uranium, um, everything. And, and so anything that our bodies are made of that's heavier than um, helium, which is pretty much everything we're made of, <laughs> uh, uh, except for hydrogen and the water in our bodies, um, was made inside of a star. And anything heavier than iron was made in a supernova explosion, pretty much. So we are literally made of star stuff. S star stuff. Um, Anyway, so type 2 supernovae are, are exciting. They're very different be, you know, depending on how massive the star was, its environment. Uh, fortunately, just a few weeks ago, we had a nice, bright, brand new supernova in the Pinwheel Galaxy. Um, so this was discovered on May 19th and uh, by an astronomer, Koichi Ita Itagaki. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, um, but in Japan. Um, so. You can see here a lovely picture of the pinwheel galaxy. This galaxy is only 21 million light years away from us. Positively close in terms of cosmic terms, but, uh, and then the supernova, you can see this new bright star showing up in the galaxy. So this was exciting because it was caught really just a few hours after it exploded. Um, unfortunately, it exploded during the daytime here. Um, but uh, so, so we didn't have a chance to discover it first, but we've been observing it since um, with our nickel telescope. So that is the telescope at the north end of the building. You should all have telescope passes to view through it later this evening, um, if the weather permits. We have a number of different instruments that can go on the telescope. I don't have time to talk about all the fascinating things we're doing with this telescope, but we're using the direct imaging camera. This is just a camera with different colored filters so we can look at the brightness of objects and what they look at in pictures. So here is some of the, the data from May 20th that we took with the nickel telescope, so just a day after it exploded. Um, so you can see the bright supernova there, 
and then one of the spiral arms of the galaxy. Not a very pretty exp picture because it was super short exposures, less than a minute, because the supernova was really bright, and it's a big telescope. Anyway, we tracked its brightness. Uh, I and my colleagues at UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley were using the nickel telescope, so the different filters, the blue dots are the blue filter data, the green dots are the green filter, red dots, red filter, yellow dots are the infrared filter. Uh, <laughs> but you can see that, you know, down here, the star was undetectable. You know, it's in a distant galaxy, um, but then it exploded, and you can see how rapidly over the next, you know, day, it got up to peak brightness. And then it started fading. And then it sort of plateaued and sort of stayed the same brightness. So this sort of shape told us that this is a type 2 supernova, because different types of supernova will have different rise times for how quickly they get bright and how quickly they fade away. Um, so this one is a type 2p, because it sort of plateaued and stopped fading uh, very quickly, which is great. Um, uh, because it tells us some interesting things about what is physically going on with the supernova and its immediate surroundings. Um, so we could take this data, we can use it to model what's happening. Um, so here's a similar plot showing the brightness uh, in other filters and, and, and including data from another telescope, but we can do models and try and figure out what was happening around this supernova before it exploded. And as I said earlier, all stars when they get old turn into red giant stars. And so this was a red supergiant star, and uh, we fit a number of models, I shouldn't say we, it was mostly done by Wynne Jacobson Galan, a uh, grad student at UC Berkeley, and uh, with the models sort of looking at how much material did the supergiant star blow off before it exploded? Supergiant stars have what are called super winds. Our own sun has a solar wind as material is coming off of it. And these red giant stars at the very end of their life have these super winds and blow off a lot of material. And they, through this fitting, discovered that uh, this was blowing off material about a hundredth of a solar mass of material a year. Now, you're probably going, well, how much is that? Well, that's about 3,300 times the mass of the Earth. The amount of stuff blowing off the star every year. And it's blowing off at, you know, speeds of maybe 50 kilometers per second. So, pretty quick. Um, we also discovered that the, the distance um, that this material got from these super winds was uh, a, a, an astonishing uh, six times 10 to 14 centimeters. Now, I don't think it's centimeters, and that's a huge number to put it into m more easily recognized units. About 3.7 billion miles out from the star is how far this the winds got. Um, so that stuff was blowing out for years. Um, and based on that, information, we could figure out, okay, these super winds were going from anywhere from three to six years before the explosion. So a short period of these super winds before the explosion. Um, and uh, let's see, I was going to say something else and it just flooded my brain. Anyway, it's cool. Um, but you know, the models, and this thick red line is the model that fits the actual data best um, and how we generate all these numbers. So that's great. So we got a lot of information about this, but there are other ways we can look at the light from the supernova. So we also use the Shane telescope. The Shane telescope is the largest telescope here on Mount Hamilton. It's three feet, three meter or 10 foot diameter mirror, um, collects a whole lot of light. When it, was when it was constructed in the 1950s, it was the second largest telescope in the world, and it remained the second largest telescope in the world until 1974. Today, it's maybe the 40th biggest telescope in the world, because in the past few d decades, there have been a lot of really enormous telescopes constructed. Um, but it also has a large number of instruments available that we can use. Um, I'll be talking about the CAST spectrograph, just one of those. And a spectrograph is an instrument that takes the light from a star and divides it up into its component colors. So it's sort of like taking a light bulb or, 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 or the sun, putting light through a prism and getting a rainbow. Um, so that's something that just emits a whole lot of light 
because it's hot. It's called a continuum spectrum. Um, if you have hot gas, things like hydrogen or helium that's excited by a nearby star, um, you can get what's called an emission spectrum. Different elements and molecules emit light preferentially at very specific colors. And so you can look at what colors are in a spectrum and say, aha, that's the pattern that hydrogen usually does. Oh, look, that's the pattern that helium does. Figure out what things are made of. Um, conversely, if you have a light source and some cool gas between you and it, um, you can get dark lines of light absorbed by the, those elements or molecules that are out there in space. And again, the same characteristic wavelengths that you might see in emission um, with a hot source, uh, hot gas source, you'll see an absorption if it's cool gas. So we see sort of all these things happening in astrophysical objects. Um, so when we looked at the spectrum of this supernova over time, uh, most of the data are from the CAS spectrograph. There are a couple other spectrographs in there. Um, but you can see very early on, you had these big emission lines. These peaks are the emission lines. And they're labeled up at the top. You have nitrogen and helium excitation. You have hydrogen. You have some carbon. Um, all in emission. And then as time goes on, those sort of fade away and you start getting absorption by those same elements. So what can we tell is physically going on here? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? Um, so what we do is uh, the width of the lines actually tells us how fast that the ejecta from the explosion is moving outwards. Um, so it's moving pretty fast at a very uh, sprightly 8,500 kilometers per second or 19 million miles per hour. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but what's happening is that when the, the supernova first happens, all that ejecta that used to be the star is very hot and it's emitting light. And then it starts plowing into all the material that came off from the star during the super winds. And that's when you start seeing it change and that you start seeing absorption um, when the, the material starts plowing into the stuff that had already come off the star previously. Um, and so we can do models of this, um, but it's, you can see how quickly over just mere days things change. But you can see the big change here is really around days, you know, four to six, where you really lose the emission features and start picking up the absorption features. And so that's when we think that things are really fundamentally changing in the structure of how the ejecta from the explosion is interacting with the circumstellar material that used to, was ejected during the super winds. So there's yet further information we can figure out about this supernova. And that is using polarization. So light, when it scatters off of dust, bounces off water, you know, when you're driving around, causes light to become polarized. So most light is unpolarized. So you think of white light as a wave, and it goes up in peak valleys. Um, when stuff is sort of vertical, we call that, you know, vertical polarization. You have also horizontal polarization where the waves are coming towards, the, you know, the, the peaks and valleys are coming towards you. And most light sources are unpolarized, so things could be any orientation. We can put in a filter that's, say, vertically polarized and block everything that's not vertical and, and uh, get just the vertical polarization through. Or conversely, we could have just horizontal polarization. Now, many of you have seen polarization because your sunglasses are polarized. Um, that's because when things bounce off like water, snow, it tends to make things horizontally polarized. And so you're Polarizing sunglasses have vertical polarization to block that glary light. Um, now, that's handy for everyday life, having polarized sunglasses. Um, but when we use a polarimeter to measure polarization with a telescope, we actually use a fancy thing like a calcite crystal or some similar thing because different polarizations take slightly different paths as they go through that medium. And so you can look at the two polarizations in two separate channels and measure the differences. And if so, if you have polarized light, you might end up with a really bright image with your horizontally polarized uh, 
image and very little light in your vertically polarized image. So we can actually look at the supernova and our spectrum at the same polarization with the spectrum at the same time and end up with plots like this. So we have overplotted the, the, the spectrum showing our nice emission lines from you know neon or not neon nitrogen and helium and hydrogen and carbon um, the the magenta lines are the percentage polarization so why do we see polarization well polarization is a supernova explosion actually tells us how the um what the shape of the explosion is it turns out when you have uh, a star or uh, material, um, the light coming straight towards you is unpolarized. However, this light coming from the edges of the stars might be scattered towards you. And so that scattering it causes polarization. If you have something perfectly spherical, the polarization scattering from the sides and the polarization scattering from the tops cancels each other out, and you end up with something that has, shows no polarization. However, most stars and anything that's spinning tend to be squashed. They tend to be a little fatter at the equator and squished in the, the, the top bottom direction. And that can actually lead to unbalanced polarization. And so you can measure sort of how squashed things are from the polarization. Now, the polarization that we measured from supernova 2023 IXF uh, is not hugely strong. It's strong for an astronomical object at 1% polarization. That's a lot of polarization for an astronomical object, even though it sounds pretty small. Um, but uh, so the, the, the percentage polarization is in these uh, magenta lines. And you can see it's very strong, 1% polarized. And then it slowly decreases to about 0.75% polarized. Um, so we know that the polarization, how squashed things are, is changing, not hugely. Um, and then the green lines is the angle of the polarization, which tells us which direction things are squashed. So it starts with the uh, polarization angle being around 160, 165 degrees. And here you can see that it slowly changes around day, day three to being about 180 and then creeps up to 220. Um, so you can see something's changing in the geometry of this supernova explosion. So um, what does that tell us? Well, some modeling done by uh, Sergei Vasilev, um, another graduate student at UC Berkeley, thinks what's happening is that we have the, the, the CSM, the, the circumstellar material that's from those big winds from the supergiant star before it exploded, and then you have the ejecta from the explosion itself. So the, the CSM is sort of squashed in one direction. And then you have the ejecta that, for whatever reason, exploded in another direction in a, in a different uh, shape. Now that we don't actually know why. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's still a mystery. And it's still early days with studying the supernova. Because remember, these data have already been submitted for publication. And the supernova happened just over a month ago. So we've been working really hard and really fast on this. Um, but you can see that over days three to five, when we saw that polarization changing, is when the ejecta is starting to emerge from where the, the superwind material was. And then eventually, it completely expands and dominates in, from then till now. And, uh, as I said, we are still taking data on this. So every few nights, more data, both imaging data to measure brightness and spectra and spectral polarimetry is being done so that we learn more about this. Yes? Has all that matter put this together? What really happens to it at that point when it collides? So, so the eject the, the, the ejecta is moving so fast and there's such a strong shock wave that essentially the CSM uh, the, gets swept up with it and starts moving out with it and interacting with it. Um, so it tends to heat up. Um, I, I will admit that that particular aspect of supernovae is not at all my expertise. This is uh, done mostly by my collaborators at UC Berkeley. Um, but yeah, it sort of gets swept up with it and so it all becomes sort of one big thing. 
it keeps expanding into space. So it will, and uh, event. Right, at some point in time, the material that was this, the, the ejecta from the supernova explosion will keep going out into space until it runs into something else. It will eventually interact with other gas molecules out there, create new clouds that will eventually collapse and form new stars. So it's a cycle. So, you know, how all these elements heavier than iron or, you know, that are in our bodies all came out of a supernova explosion for the most part at some point in the past and got swept up into other interstellar material, collapsed again, created new stars. So anyway, so that was the first exciting new data here from Lick Observatory. It's had all data hot off the presses. Um, so I'm going to talk about another thing with the Shane telescope, which is our adaptive optic system, which is some of the new technology. I've talked about some of the new science. This is some of the new technology. So adaptive optics helps sharpen our images through the telescopes. When you look at a star in the sky, you'll notice it twinkles most of the time. Very pretty, not good for astronomy. <laughs> uh, it turns out because that's, there's turbulence in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is blurring images. So even a huge telescope like the Shane 3 meter won't get as good resolution as you would expect because of this blurring. So we can mechanically correct the turbulence with a small mirror that can change its shape up to a couple thousand times a second to put anti-turbulence in the system to correct for it. And so I have a lovely animation that was uh, created by the Gemini telescope. Whoops. You're supposed to play. Come on, play. There we go. Um, but this will show the light, how it goes through the telescope. Bounces off the primary mirror to the secondary mirror, goes back to the instrument on the back. So Gemini has a system where it can have multiple instruments mounted. Our Shane telescope isn't quite so sophisticated. But here we get a cutaway of that. So we have the, the light coming through the system. The red light, in this case, is going to the science camera over here. The blue light is being sent to this thing called a wave front sensor, which is actually measuring the turbulence. And so now we'll have the aberrated light, the turbulence, be these little potato chips flying through the system. That's our graphical representation of the turbulence and how it's changing over time. And now we're going to measure the turbulence and then send a signal putting anti-turbulence on the mirror, changing its shape, maybe as many as a couple thousand times a second, to undo the turbulence. So now all the light is properly aligned, all the turbulence is gone, and we end up with nice, sharp images through the system. So before the turbulence, you know, we correct the turbulence, you can see that every few milliseconds the light is being changed and moved around, and then we end up with a nice, sharp, stable spot. So this is conceptually what adaptive optics is doing. Now Lick Observatory has been doing adaptive optics here for now a couple decades. Now, most of the time, you use a bright star to measure the turbulence. That's the best thing to do. But there aren't actually that many bright stars in the sky. It turns out only 1% of the sky is close enough to a bright star to make this technique work. So we can use a laser to create a star wherever we need one to make the measurements. Um, and so you can see the laser coming out of the dome. Um, the light actually, we're, we're fortunate that up about uh, 60 miles above our head, 90 kilometers, is, is part of the atmosphere called the mesosphere. And that's where the atmosphere gets thick enough to have uh, meteors burn up. And so up at that altitude, we have metals from meteors that have been destroyed, like potassium, calcium, sodium, iron, nickel. Great. It turns out sodium likes to fluoresce at this very particular color of yellow. If you've ever seen any of the yellow uh, sodium street lamps in San Jose, they're going away, they're being replaced by LEDs, but you know, if you'd seen them in the past, our laser is exactly that color yellow, and it goes up there. The sodium atoms fluoresce. Great, you have a bright star. Well, not so bright star, but bright enough star to measure the turbulence caused by the atmosphere so you can correct it. So it works great. However, this is a powerful laser. We can put up to about 10 watts of laser power. This little laser pointer I'm using is probably half a milliwatt to one milliwatt of power. Um, so this is thousands of times more powerful. 
Um, so it could blind pilots and airplanes, could blind satellites in space or astronauts on the space station. So I have to coordinate with the FAA to make sure that we don't blind any pilots. And I also have to coordinate with Space Force Space Command to make sure that uh, we shut down our laser and don't damage any satellites or astronauts. Uh, so it's, you know, complicated. But, you know, it's cool. It's like, I have Space Command on my cell phone. <laughs> Um, anyway, here's some sample data. Uh, this is a little planetary nebula. So without adaptive optics, this is the fuzzball you get. The turbulence, it's, it's not a bad image. It's actually, you know, an arc second across. Um, but when you use the adaptive optic system, you can see the white dwarf star at the center and then the ring of material. So I think, if we're lucky, the 36-inch telescope tonight is actually looking at a planetary nebula called the Ring Nebula. So you'll see uh, an object that's rather closer and larger on the sky than this one, but uh, that looks sort of similar. Um, now, planets in our solar system, we don't need to use the laser. Uh, Uranus is bright enough. It's, it can, you know, we can measure the turbulence from looking at Uranus directly. And so without adaptive optics, it looks like a big blob. With adaptive optics, you could start seeing the storms and cloud bands. And if you could see it, Uranus has a ring. So not as spectacular as the ring of Saturn, but you can see, and then we've got various moons of Uranus. So one of the recent science programs we've been doing is not looking, well, we've been looking at Uranus, but it turns out Neptune, we've also been looking at, Neptune is actually a lot more active and interesting. Um, so we periodically look at Neptune and see its storms. And back in 2017, Neptune had a big honking bright storm there. Um, discovered with the Keck telescope, but we were following it both with Keck telescopes in Hawaii and here at Lick Observatory, observing it pretty frequently and tracking that storm as it was going around Neptune and trying to figure out more details about how the atmosphere of Neptune works and why these storms come. Now, most of the storms that we see on Neptune last days to maybe a few weeks, this big storm lasted months, and that's excuse me, highly unusual. So we tracked it, um, and that storm, the size, it was, it was big. It was over five, about 5,000 miles across. Uh, so that's, that's uh, pretty, pretty big, almost the size of the Earth um, in size. Uh, but we were measuring the zonal drift speed. So at that, you know, it was also unusual to have a big storm that close to the equator of Neptune. Um, but it, but it uh, had a variable speed moving for the first you know, month or so that we knew it existed. And then it settled down to be a constant moving, drifting across Neptune's surface about uh, 240 meters per second. So that's a pretty s speedy storm. Um, so these, these you know, cloud bands on Neptune actually rotate pretty quickly. Um, but this was published uh, by Ned Moulter in 2019. Of course, we didn't stop there. Neptune is constantly changing, so we've taken more data. And Arandi Chavez, another uh, student at UC Berkeley, uh, published another paper about more storms on Neptune. And curiously, in 2020, Neptune was quiet, had very few storms. So we don't know why that happened. Usually it's pretty active. Um, anyway, so that's paper has just been, uh, just been published uh, last month. And of course, we're still observing Neptune. So this is data hot off the presses um, that we observed in the past week or so. Um, so you can see here, we discovered another big, huge honking storm on Neptune. This one's much closer to the, the, the poles, not near the equator, which is much more normal for the big storms on Neptune. This is sort of looking at the other side of Neptune. Not a lot of big storms, a few smaller storms. So these are all raw data. These have not been processed or analyzed at all. Um, those are screenshots from when we were taking the data. But uh, Neptune rotates about once every 16 hours. So every three days, if you observe at the same time, you see the same side of Neptune. So the, the data from June 29th, July 1st, and July 3rd are all sort of looking at the same side of Neptune. And uh, you can see that this big storm is not quite so distinct and uh, now has a buddy or maybe it was one storm before, now it's split into two. We don't know yet. We have lots of data to process. Um, and again, they're fading out and not so visible a few days later. So um, that's where we are with Neptune. So like I said, all brand new data. 
Now, of course, at Lick Observatory, we don't just look at planets in our own solar system. We discover exoplanets. And so the Automated Planet Finder is a robotic telescope that our second robotic telescope here on Mount Hamilton, 2.4 meter diameter telescope. Uh, and it's looking for planets around other stars using what's called the radial velocity technique. And let's see if I can get this uh, to play. Yes. So when you have a planet orbiting a star, that actually the star wobbles just a bit. Now this is hugely exaggerated. <laughs> uh, so you can see the motion. You know, mostly you can't see it. But we can detect it by looking at the spectra of a star. So as the, the s planet goes around the star and they, common, they orbit around their common center of mass, you see the star, the spectra, the lines, the absorption lines will move to the blue as the star is moving towards us, to the red as the star moves away from us. And while we can't see the planet directly, you can infer its presence. And... Uh, and you can get plots like this of how the velocity is changing and infer the presence of a star. So this is one of the early discoveries of a planet around another star, around 70 Virginis, um, with something like a, you know, almost seven Jupiter mass planet going around this star with a period of a mere 117 days. Yeah. So are we detecting the planet or are we detecting the star? So, so we, we, we are detecting the motion of the star, the, the very small motion of the star towards and away from us, and inferring the presence of the planet because it's a periodic motion. Now, it turns out that the APF has gotten very good at discovering multiple planet systems so with lots of data um, and uh, lots of observing time with a robotic telescope, since this is all it does. It can observe a lot of stars very frequently and discover you know, planets in short orbits that go around maybe in just a few days and maybe other planets that orbit the star over months. Um, anyway, so here's a system uh, that has, I don't know, six or seven planets around it. Looks like a mini solar system. A lot of these planets are very close in. Their, their periods are very short. Uh, three days, seven days, 23 days. So these planets are all way closer to their parent star than the Earth is to our star, or even Mercury is to, from, its, uh, uh, from the sun. Uh, so there's a lot of this. But to make these data and measure these spectra and this is these oscillations, you need to get light down a very small slit in the camera to take these spectra. And it turns out, Atmospheric turbulence hurts us here, too. <laughs> um, so instead of having all the light just sitting right there on the slit where you want it, it's bouncing all over the place because of atmospheric turbulence. As I said, that twinkling of the stars, that is very pretty, but not very good for astronomy. And so we're not as efficient as we could be. So we're thinking we should put adaptive optics on the Automated Planet Finder Telescope. So this is a new project that uh, we're working on the technology. Uh, but instead of having a little pyramid after, or a little uh, deformable mirror to correct the turbulence after it's, the light's gone through the telescope, we're thinking we'll put an adaptive secondary mirror on the telescope. And so this is a mirror that has little pistons on the back so it can change its shape and put the anti-turbulence on the second mirror the light hits as it goes through the telescope path. Um, this is a sort of new technology. It's very difficult to make a piece of glass that's the right curved shape that's very thin, so it's flexible, but won't break. Uh, so they're working at the Laboratory for Adaptive Optics at UC Santa Cruz to work on this, what's called slumping uh, uh, procedure for the glass to get it the right shape. Um, but if we succeed in making this work, that light will stay much better centered on the slit and we'll have um, much more efficient telescope, be able to data, gather data either on fainter stars or more quickly on the stars we're already observing. So it would be essentially taking our single automated planet finder telescope and making it as effective as two or three. So we'll get a lot more data and discover a lot more planets around other stars. So this is some of the technology that's coming in the future, we hope, to Lick Observatory uh, to, to increase our uh, scientific productivity. Um, and with that, 
thank you very much. And I'll take a few questions. Yes. Two types of supernovas. One was discovered in May last period of days or weeks. The other kind, what sort of a time frame was it? So, so the type 1As, the other kind, they tend to last weeks to months total. They, they fade away generally, you know, pretty quickly. I mean, the, it depends a little bit on what is going on around them. If there's a lot of material around them, gas, dust, uh, they tend to persist a little longer because there's interactions with that versus just having the explosion. Uh, all by itself will go uh, disappear quicker. Um, so, so in that respect, they're very similar to type two supernovae, these core collapse supernovae that, su that when massive stars die, um, that again, the, the rise times are a little different. And unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't remember all the, the fine details. But, um, but they do, they tend to you know, get very bright over a series of days and then they start fading, and it can take months for the explosion to fade away. Yeah. Why is it that it takes 1.4 years? So, so that actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's sort of the magic number. It's, it's called the Chandrasekhar limit. Um, and it has to do with the theory, um, that unfortunately quantum mechanics falls into this with the Fermi exclusion principle that, uh, you, you know, that after a certain amount of mass that the, the, um, the, the electrons can't, you know, get squeezed any closer or the neutrons in the case of a neutron star and things collapse and uh, so it's, it's all, as I said, it unfortunately gets into quantum mechanics, which I don't have enough time here to give you a primer on uh, quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah. So, so currently, it is limited to the Milky Way. Uh, typically, th that technique really requires sort of brighter stars to observe. Um, there is another method called the transit method, which I didn't mention, um, but that's where you, you look at a star and the, the, the planet goes right in front of it from our perspective and block some of the light. And so many more planets have been discovered with the transit method because you could set up a big wide field camera and look at a lot of stars at the same time. And they did this with the Kepler Space Telescope and with the TESS uh, satellite in space now. Um, so they're discovering lots of planets around other stars with that technique. Radial velocity is a nice complementary technique, but it takes longer, and you can only look at one star at a time with the way we do it. Um, there are actually a couple other ways of discovering planets around other stars, but these are the two main techniques. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's see if I can explain this in a reasonable way that will make sense. Um, it is much easier to, you know, when you, when you save an image, there's noise involved with saving that image and that overwhelms the information. You lose the phase information of what the atmosphere was doing to the light. Um, and that's something that when you mechanically correct it, you, you, you don't lose that information. And you get higher signal to noise when you take the data and read it out, because our detectors are noisy. Um, and so at what point you add the noise makes a huge difference. Um, and plus the algorithms, there's no way to extract all the information algorithmically from the data once you've, you've detected those photons. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> So, but I think with that, I think I need to uh, stop and you need to go look through telescopes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>